Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Michael Jr., thanks for coming on, man. We're, uh, when's your, uh, what's your morning look like tomorrow? Uh, we're, we're recording this at about 8.15 at night. What, uh, what time do you think you'll be getting up tomorrow? Uh, alarm goes off at 2.45 every day, so get up uh, bright and early and get ready to go in and try and entertain people. We'll see if we're successful. So you've been now, um, you currently are on the lead-in radio show to your father's show. So you're on, what, 4 to 6 a.m.? 4 to 6 a.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, yeah. And how far do you live from the studio? I'm like 20 minutes from uh, headquarters in Bristol, so it's not too bad. And, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's not really anyone on the road, so it's pretty much smooth sailing into work. Man, so then what time, so you're on air 4 to 6. Does your dad take over at 6? Yeah, they take over right at six. So I see him. Uh, he walks right by our studio on his way into work. So we're uh, we're two ships literally passing in the night or early morning, depending on how you look at it. So after you do that four to six show, if you don't have any other shows that day, what? How long do you hang around, or do you get to go home shortly after? I usually can get out of there as quickly as I want to. I mean, we'll do some odds and ends after our show, but I'm usually out of the building. That's my night sleep in the morning after the fact because I try and stay up and watch the games and do everything the night before. So I go to bed at 11, 11.30 at night, sleep for a couple hours, and then I get home in the morning and try and get most of my quote-unquote night sleep then. Have you? Uh, or do you think you'll you ever get used to that, waking up at 2.45? Uh, no, there's always some uh, some not so silent curse words uttered as soon as I wake up every morning, and then you quickly just start caffeinating and getting ready to go for it. But the the upside is being done basically at 6 a.m. unless anything else is going on. So it's a it's a pretty fair trade off, but it does mess your body clock up a little bit. Now, what is it like when you uh, during the football season? I know you co-host a college football show. At least I've seen you on there a bunch. When is that daily, weekly? How does that work? Yeah, so uh, during the fall, I did that uh, on Monday every week. I would go down to ESPNU. Their campus is in Charlotte. So I would do a radio show Sunday morning in Bristol and then you know watch the 1 o'clock games, get on a flight down to Charlotte, and then our show was Monday afternoon that I would go do down there. So I'd be down in Charlotte Monday afternoon, stay and do the radio show on Tuesday, and then be back in Bristol for the rest of the week. Okay, so just backing up a little bit, what year did you graduate Notre Dame? I graduated in uh, so I graduated in 2012. I did a fifth year and played that fall. So my last fall was uh, 2012, and technically left school in 13. So were you already graduated when you played your fifth year? Yeah, I already graduated. I was technically a, a post grad that fall. I you know was it? I didn't take anything towards like a post grad degree. They were just uh non-degree seeking classes i think they called it basically i took like guitar and directed reading and stuff like that so what you have to have a certain amount of hours just to be eligible yeah i think it was nine hours you had to take so i had i had one class that actually met on campus and everything else you know i had you know uh, like a paper i had to write the semester and my guitar teacher came to my house it was uh, a pretty low maintenance semester <laughs> man that would be I, I was always kind of jealous when i saw some of the fifth year guys and saw their just cake schedule and i guess it, it, you deserve it if you go ahead and you graduate and, and you're just working on your postgrad but would that could you have had enough time to work on like a masters yeah i had some uh friends of mine especially some of the guys that were early enrollee dudes that would do uh they had like a one year accelerated mba program <laughs> that guys that i actually had a buddy of mine who get his first year he was a uh, two years older than i was did his fifth year and did his first year of law school during the football season in the fall, which was a, a brutal load for him. So I saw that and figured I'd back it off a little bit right there. I never really, you know, saw myself going into business right away. I was a film and television guy, which is kind of our co communications major. So this was something I always kind of wanted to do. And Notre Dame didn't really have a postgraduate degree that, that went towards that. So when did that start? When did you realize that you wanted to follow, I guess, in your dad's footsteps? Uh, I, I think pretty early on, uh, once I got to college, you know, we had to declare, I think, my sophomore year for major, and, and I kind of gravitated towards that right away. I was always pretty good at talking, so I figured outside of hitting people, if I could convince someone to pay me to talk, I'd be in business. And uh, I, got, I got lucky, you know, Notre Dame and our team 
let me do a lot of video and uh, and behind the scenes stuff with our team and get a lot of reps and practice at that to to kind of supplement what I was doing class wise. Now, where so after you graduated uh, and played your fifth year at Notre Dame, take us through where your professional career went. Yeah, so I uh, I was an undrafted free agent with the Steelers in 2013. I went to training camp with them. Uh, I got cut the last round of cuts, so right at the end of uh, right at the beginning of September, got cut with them. Worked out for that year. Worked out with a couple of teams. Tried to sign on. Ended up signing with the Saints that next off season. Went to their off season program. Got cut there, and then kind of did the whirlwind route from there. Did training camp in Canada. And, you know, uh, didn't end up sticking around up there. There was uh, an expansion league called the FXFL that was very short lived and something that I, uh, I went with that fall and then ended up doing one more tour with the Saints. I did uh, the next off season and training camp with them that fall. Same thing, made it to the last round of cuts, you know, put a put a bunch of good tape out there and sort of said I let the chips fall where they may. And, you know, the third crack at that and. When the calls stop coming in, it makes the decision pretty easy there. And so I, I kind of looked around and said, okay, uh, at this point, it doesn't look like that. That's going to be a route I'm going to be able to keep going. And that was when I, you know, started having that conversation with, okay, what can I do to to start to bridge the gap and get into to radio and the things I wanted to do next. So with your time at Notre Dame, where you you played for Brian Kelly your whole time. Uh, so I had Charlie Weiss my first two years, 2008 and 2009, and then I had BK for the last three. Can you give us like a contrast of them, like how they the culture was different between Charlie Weiss and Brian Kelly? Uh, I, yeah, I think Charlie, especially for him, because Notre Dame was his first job after the pros, still ran it very much like that. Like his his offense was a pro offense and everything, but – uh, I think he just had a hard time getting away from that mentality when it came to being around a college campus, whereas, you know, Brian, his whole background was in college coaching. And so he kind of came in and and, you know, knew his process a little bit more with that. They were both different. You know, I still I was just at uh, Coach Weiss's golf tournament down in Florida. So I keep in touch with him a fair amount there. I mean, he was the guy that recruited me and, and offered me a scholarship and uh, you know, he was he was always brutally honest. I'd say that was the the hallmark of uh, of Charlie's era at Notre Dame was you may not always like what you're going to hear, but you knew exactly where you stood with him at all times. And I know all of us valued that a lot. And and that was how he ran it. He was you know very much from that Belichick Parcells tree where you know, if you did something wrong, he was going to let you know about it. But it, he was going to be fair to everyone and, and and make sure that you always knew where you stood with him. Yeah, he, Charlie Weiss is – I mean, so my brother-in-law is Brady Quinn, and he played for Charlie, and I've met Charlie a few times. I know Brady has tons of respect for him and loves loves what Charlie did for him in his career. And uh, Charlie's such a funny like character to me. Just He came from that Belichick era, goes to Notre Dame, signed with a 10-year contract like a year or two in, I think, was okay. it? And I think they just – that just finished – he's just got finished – getting payments from Notre Dame, I think, a year or two ago. Is that right? Yeah, it was incredible. You know, even after he left, he said that him and his wife would toast to Notre Dame once a year, and it was when that check came around December sometime there. And, uh, yeah, you know, he had a lot of success early at Notre Dame there with Brady and those guys going to some BCS games. And I I think they saw you guys, unfortunately, in a BCS game that didn't go too well for him. But, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and you know, so got that contract there. And then, uh, you know, things unfortunately went awry, and we all – you know, took our degree of responsibility in that because, you know, as well as anyone, the, the coaches certainly set a tone, especially in college. But, you know, we didn't go out there and perform the way we felt like we needed to. And ultimately, he was the one that had to answer for that. So it was it was unfortunate the way it worked out. But the payday certainly worked out nicely for him. <laughs> yeah, more power to him. I don't blame him one second. But my question is, why would the AD at the time ever sign anybody to a 10 year deal? Uh, sorry, you broke up a little bit there. What was that? Oh, my bad. No, I wonder why would any athletic director sign a coach to a ten-year contract? Yeah, it's, so it's always interesting for me, especially at a place like Notre Dame, where your resources are more or less unlimited when it comes to things like that. 
And the, the thought process I always had was that it, maybe for recruiting wise, you can point to that and say, all right, we've got stability at this position right here, knowing full well that if you want to make a move, you're going to be willing and able to eat that cost on the back end the way that they did. It's not the best look because that becomes the running joke then every year is you're still paying that coach uh, the way it did with Coach Weiss. But I think at the time, maybe if you're looking to say, all right, we can go into a kid's living room and say, we believe we've got long-term stability at that position right now. This is a guy we're confident in. So at least in the short term, when you're telling kids that, you have the the, the credence to back it up. Yeah, what, what's it look like now? What do you think the future of Notre Dame football is? I know last year, what? how many wins did they have? Four last year. It was four and eight. So it was uh, it was – the worst record they had had since the year before I got to Notre Dame is Coach Weiss's third to last year when they went three and nine. And uh, to be honest, the situation to me looks a lot like what we saw last year with uh, Les Miles and LSU to where he was basically given that offseason to make changes and show that he was going to take the program in uh, a, a new direction for them. And, you know, in Les's case, he didn't, you know, he didn't move on Cam Cameron as their offensive coordinator, didn't really make a ton of changes in the way he did business. And a few games into the season, their record you know, went south and he got shown the door. So, uh, you know, to Coach Kelly's credit, he's made a lot of changes this offseason, hired new offensive and defensive coordinator, made a change in the strength and conditioning coach. And, you know, just being around there now and talking to a lot of the coaches there's a, a renewed energy in the building. So he's gone out and showed that he's willing to, to self-scout a little bit and make some of those changes. We'll see if they pay off because at the end of the day, if they go out there and drop three of their first four, I have a feeling that the, uh, the exit's going to start to light up there. Yeah, no question. It has to be one of the, one of the most uh, pressure-packed jobs in all of college football, I would imagine, because as a coach, you do. You know they have those unlimited resources, and those boosters and everybody else will step up real quick say hey well, don't worry we'll we'll cover your uh we'll cover his buyout if we want to move on I, I mean i can't imagine yeah like as all the big programs are they uh they demand winners and, and only four victories is not going to cut it but do they is this is it a real thing can you explain the academic like the standards for notre dame is that is it truly that much harder to get in or have a player become eligible and they they can only target so many guys because they know they just cannot get some players in yeah and, and I think a lot of it too yeah getting in I mean that's always uh, kind of the running joke is that the hardest part about graduating from Notre Dame is just getting in because once you get there like so many other college programs they've got the resources to make sure that you know, you're taken care of they've got the tutors and they've got the structure there but uh, especially at Notre Dame too I think just because what's asked and required of you to stay eligible once you're there is so tough and the way that they enforce their academic standards. I mean, it's, it's almost a zero tolerance policy. So you'll see, you know, we've seen plenty of academic suspensions for Notre Dame guys that, that are a direct reflection of the school's code of conduct policy, not, you know, the NCAA, not a conference or anything. So they hold themselves to that standard pretty rigorously. And you learn pretty quick when you're there that you're either going to fall in line with that, or you can, you can drown pretty quickly in all of that because it can get overwhelming at times. So can you like, what, what would one of those standards, those like the school standards they have that say Alabama or Ohio state may not have like what, if they miss a couple classes, do they suspend you? Well, between that, you know, they call them honor code violations, too, to where, you know, you get caught cheating on a test or something. And all of a sudden the school goes and reviews that and finds that. And, you know, we uh, we had more than a few kids miss entire seasons or miss four or five games during the course of the year. And so you you kind of understand that while it, you know it, in certain situations, some of those guys were our, our better players. And you quickly learned that there was no one that was really above that because, as much as, you know, in all these big time schools, the football program tends to have a lot of control. There's no bigger control than the folks sitting in the Golden Dome over there on the academic side who understand that, you know, they've been there long before and will be there long after. So it's going to be their way or the highway. Who was the quarterback that he, he was the starter and he transferred and did he come back? What was his name? Oh, Everett Golson. Yeah, he missed, uh, missed, the, whole se missed the whole season and then uh, ended up coming back. So is he there now? I, I, I missed this whole uh, no. timeline. Yeah, no. So Everett was a redshirt freshman my uh, my fifth year, senior year when we played in the national title. And then he missed, uh, I believe it was the following year. 
and then came back after that, did pretty well. He graduated now, I want to say two years ago. I believe he's playing in the CFL somewhere now, but he's uh, he's a couple years removed from being the guy. Okay, and he so he was suspended for a season. Did they say what it was for? Uh, I think it was it was just that it was an honor code violation. Got caught. I'm not sure if it, I can't remember if it was multiple offenses or not. And you know, I don't want to uh, to speak to something I don't have the total specifics of. But it, it was one of those honor code violations where you know if they they find you guilty and Notre Dame's got you know their their board on that that reviews all that stuff and goes over it pretty uh, with a pretty fine tooth comb. And when they find that you're in violation of the standard they've set, doesn't matter if you're the starting quarterback or the you know a, a walk on on the team, they made their presence felt on that one, and Notre Dame certainly had to deal with the consequences on the field. Yeah, they. I, I've heard Brian Kelly, I, th- I believe, speak to his frustration sometime on certain players that he may not be able to recruit just because of the standards. Is that something that all the coaches have to deal with at Notre Dame? Yeah, you're cognizant of that because I think as much as it is difficulty of getting guys in with the academic standards, it's also realizing, all right, when we, when they get there, is this going to be a guy that's going to be able to keep up with the course load and, and what's asked of them on the academic side? Because if you get them in, that's all fine and good. But if they get to school there and, you know, like in those situations, they can't be on the field because they're suspended – or even if they are ready to be on the field and they're so overwhelmed by everything that's asked of them that it really negates a lot of the thing, the reasons that you'd be recruiting them anyway. So it does make it tough for a lot of those guys. And, and there's a lot of areas of the country that you know going into it. And like Stanford and like Northwestern and Duke are kind of dealing with in the same vein. You understand that those are going to limit certain areas where you can recruit athletes, you know, defensive backs, pass rushers things like that that get a lot harder to recruit knowing the areas of the country that usually produce the best talent there. Man, I I feel for the, the, the assistant coaches that have their territories to recruit. I know how brutal it is. I live about two minutes away from Luke Fickle, who just took the university of Cincinnati job and he's going to be moving, moving his whole whole six kids and the family down there. But he kind of has, I feel like with him, at least he has a great situation going to Cincinnati. He grew up in Columbus, Catholic school kid, He's in tight with all of the high school coaches around Ohio. So now as the head coach of UC, he can go maybe, I don't know if he could steal players that maybe would have gone to Ohio State, but he could get some fringe players maybe that would have gone to, say, like a pit or somewhere that was not Ohio State. Do you like do high school, do people have any idea really how important recruiting is and especially being like how an assistant coach's job, I think, is to recruit his area, and that's the number one job. After that, I think coaching secondary. It really is. And I think if you look at a lot of the guys that end up going on to have success as head coaches, they're guys that really get, like you mentioned in that area there, guys that really get their claws in in some of these big-time areas right there. I mean, we know Texas is such a hotbed. And so when you get a, a coach that – can recruit those areas you know Tom Herman who uh, ended up down at Houston was a guy I heard had a really strong foothold in Texas there and so now as he becomes the successor at UT those are all things that benefit him because he's got that foundation and that bedrock already recruiting like you said those high school coaches because we always talk about coaching being a, a profession built on relationships well maybe in college no relationship more important than what that coach assistant or otherwise has with the high school coaches in the area that he's tasked with uh, as his main recruiting spot. Do you have to uh, do a lot of shows or or radio, any material on like recruiting in high school classes and kids coming out? Uh, Yeah, especially, you know, we just got, you know, signing day was however many weeks ago now. And so especially when you get around that and you see just uh, the way recruiting has evolved so much now that the dog and pony show that it is and uh, always kind of moving. So you, yeah, more and more that you got to kind of parse through to see what's actually going on. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of that that was going on here recently, and even you know during the fall, recruiting is one of those things that yeah, you know never stops. It's a, it's a it's a year round deal for these coaches and otherwise, and so you see what a, a stressful process it is for everyone. Did you ever think about coaching? 
Uh, very little. I always liked the, I guess, T. I was always a guy that could probably uh, be a little better, do as I say, not as I do. But uh, so that aspect of it and being able to teach guys was always really appealing to me. But, you know, you saw it up close and we all do just what a grind it is on, on these coaches and their families. And you talk to guys who have how, you know, are still paying off mortgages in two and three states that they've moved on through and, uh, you know, constantly have to pull their kids in and out of school. And it just, it's a lot of hours and a lot of things that go into it, just like playing where you only see on Saturdays what these guys are doing and, and not all the time they're spending away from their families. And so I, I thought if push came to shove and I could you know go into what I'm doing now or go into coaching, uh, I would take the, the hours and what I you know had already seen firsthand watching my dad do it his whole life and the amount of time it afforded him to spend with us. I thought – all right, that's probably something that fits a little more what I want lifestyle-wise. Well, the thing is, I don't know. So how old are you now? 27. Okay, so I'm 33. And the first Golic that really jumped off the screen to me was your uncle Bob as the RA in Saved by the Bell the college years. Did you get to see that? Uh, yeah, so I've I've seen, you know, obviously the college years were a little more short-lived, so I yeah. saw a majority of those episodes, but it, it's so funny for, you know, as long as my dad's been doing the show and him and Bob both, uh, you know, playing good long NFL careers, when I meet people 95% of the time, that's the first thing that comes up. Oh, that's awesome. I'm, ha- I'm so happy to hear that. I'm, yeah. So they, do they ask, did Bob go on to any other acting gigs after that? Uh, he had a few minor ones here and there when he finished up, you know, because he spent some time in Oakland with the Raiders. So I think getting a little bit of taste of being out there in Cali, he thought he would try his hand at acting for a while. So he went out there and did the headshots and did everything else trying to to make his hay there. And the college years was about as good as it got. And so ironically enough, he was an RA named Mike, which is my dad's name. So you can imagine the confusion that kind of arose from that. But uh, I think that I think we can consider that the pinnacle of his acting career. Oh, it was awesome. And for all the, the guy, the people younger than us, I think I, I mean, I must have seen it when it was first out, I, I believe. I, I watched Saved by the Bell growing up and then that came on. And so I remember watching your uncle and then your dad comes on the scene with Mike and Mike, I guess shortly after. And I, I, it even confused me. I'm like, wait, so this is not the RA. This is not Big Mike the RA from the college years. This is his brother. And I got so confused. And I think everyone probably still is. Oh, yeah. Listen, I've been around my dad plenty long enough to hear him get called Bob in public just because of that, because there's there is so much of that name confusion that the people in the college years, I guess, didn't really think through when they named the character for the show. So if only they knew the confusion they'd cause my family for the rest of their lives. Oh, no question. Now, Bob, he does radio in Cleveland, right? Yeah, he does talk radio out of Cleveland right now. And my dad's whole side of the family, you know, they were born and bred in Cleveland. So they're all still out there on that side. My grandma and his other uh, brother, Greg, who was uh, uh, an old lineman at Notre Dame, too. So they're all still uh, camped out in Cleveland. Wow. So are, is anyone, any Golic not allowed, or allowed to go somewhere other than Notre Dame? Uh, you know what? That was always the running joke is when we got started in recruiting, dad's like, you can go wherever you want, but. <laughs> When you grow up swaddled in blue and gold and it's all over the house and every picture frame is Notre Dame and every carpet in the house is Notre Dame. And you know, from the time I was in fourth grade on, I think we went to two games a year. So the brainwashing took hold pretty quick. So I call it good parenting. I hope one day I can pass that on and do the same thing where you give the illusion of choice, but the decision part. <laughs> Did your mom go to Notre Dame? She went to St. Mary's, so she was right across the street at the all-girls school there. As uh, it, it's your textbook, you know, Notre Dame football player, St. Mary's girl, find their uh, find their way together, and the rest is history. That's awesome, like Rudy Rudiger. Yeah, pretty uh, pretty Cordy. much. It's. I mean, it's, your dad uh, had a much better career than Rudy, but he, uh, Rudy was courting a girl from St. Mary's. Oh yeah, listen, he's a he's a smart he's a smart guy. He knew his way. Uh, he knew his way around that uh, that spot across the street, across campus there. So, do you ever come across the real Rudy? Yeah, so he came back a couple of times early on when I was at Notre Dame and, and and spoke to the team and was around campus. I mean, he's a guy that can can always kind of come around there and be pretty well received. But it is funny, you know, to hear because my Uncle Bob was a freshman on that team and, and you know, uh, and, and hear those guys talk about Rudy. And it's like, yeah, it's a great movie. But, you know, he was that guy that, you know, in those Thursday practices and the scout team was probably going with a little bit too much juice that you had to check every once in a while. <laughs> For sure. Do, do they ever speak to the the authenticity of the movie? 
Yeah, you know, you understand that some of the football portions of it were blown up a little bit from Hollywood, but the backstory and a lot of the the things he went through in the road to get there was it was all pretty spot on. It's 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 like anything else. Hollywood will take some liberties with certain things to make it juicier, but for the most part, it's it's built up to be a lot of what it is. And yeah, I guess I mean that's a lot of people when you ask their favorite movie, Rudy, it tops the list for for. Uh... A lot of people, especially anybody that has any Notre Dame ties, but I always wonder because I think Rudy was one of the—I don't know if he was a co-writer, co-producer, like the act. He was in on the story, I guess, or maybe just a consultant. Yeah, no, he was—he was consulted on there, and, and you know, he may, i am sure he made sure that the most glowing parts of the story were put in there. I mean, anyone would want themselves to look good in that process, but uh, you know, see, so you, you understand to take some of it with a grain of salt, but it was always just interesting for us because you watch that movie and. Uh, Once you get there, I mean, we all grew up watching it and then you get on campus and watch it again and you just start picking the spots around campus that you've been to and seen now and and see where they film the movie. And, you know, you see you remember Vince Vaughn being in there and he was a guy that was around campus a fair amount when we were at school, too. So you kind of have that added uh, that added layer of things right there. Like, all right, this is this is a pretty cool thing that now you kind of get to live and be a part of a little bit. Yeah, no question. It it is fun to to see. I think that's how everybody knows the Notre Dame campus just from watching that movie even if you haven't been there but I've been to Notre Dame's campus after seeing the movie and it's true you do try to like pick out the spots that you saw in that movie but there's so many damn stars in that movie I mean uh what's the the, the big old John Favreau when he was all a lot heavier Vince oh, Vaughn yeah. was Vince Vaughn did Vince throw the the pass to um at the end of the game did he say screw the coach and throw like a halfback pass was that Vince that threw it or was he the receiver it was uh, – Vince was the uh, – I think he was the receiver. I want to say he was the receiver. Yeah, he did something at the end of the game to make sure that Rudy was going to get his shine at the uh, at the end of it on defense there. That was after he had his, uh, you know, his bout with the coach there where he told him if he had Rudy's heart, he would have been an All-American and all that. So Vince Vaughn was kind of the bad boy of that movie that uh, ended up being the, uh, the the savior at the end, which is – is always interesting and funny now now knowing the career he's gone on to. Oh yeah, and then Vince put his finger in Rudy's chest. That was for you. I think it was I think that was Rudy. Yep. Oh yeah, that was uh, yep. that was Vince right at the end there. See, listen for an Ohio State guy, Ooh. you get it. You understand? I got <laughs> it, man. Well, I, my family run, they run deep with Notre Dame ties on my in-law side. My oh, wife yeah. my wife lived at Notre Dame for a summer with her brother, so she is diehard Notre Dame. We would drive back from Green Bay. Uh to Ohio and she would try to drive through South Bend and light a candle at the grotto and do the whole, the whole deal, man. She tried to rope me in. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Once you, you kind of get your, uh, get your ties to there, it's really hard to break. We all find our way back there as often as we can, but, uh, yeah, I think your wife has the one of the more uh, more famous jerseys in the history of Notre Dame lore. The, the the split jersey from the bowl game that I don't think any of us will ever forget. Oh no. Notre Dame people can't be happy about that. Trust me. <laughs> she, yeah, that's a we yeah, we had no idea. So so naive. We were so naive, young young little pups. But uh man, it, it, see hearing your voice, you sound so much like your dad. When I mean the real question I'm sure everybody asks you, when are you about to take over and, and start co-hosting with him, Mike and Mike, but it's you two and not Greenberg. Yeah, you know, it, it's something we've we've thought about and talked about a lot because we've been fortunate to get to work together some already since I started on at ESPN and uh, that's been really cool for us. I think that was one of the things too, that was really appealing th- thinking about going into this line of work was knowing we'd have that opportunity and, and just how easy it is, you know, going to work with him. He's a guy that I've known for 27 years. So you've got that, uh, you know, even for him and Greeny who have been together for 17 years and had such a long partnership, you can't you know, replace the comfort that comes with working with your dad. So we're we're trying to work that in as best we can right now and see if we can make it look good and appealing to the suits who have to make those decisions. But, uh, uh, you know, it sounds like we'll get to do more and more of that going forward right now for, you know, however long dad keeps doing this. And, and we just look forward to it, man. I mean, what, what a cool opportunity. So many people in different places in life have a chance to work with their dads. We just get to do it in a really visible space uh, where a lot of people get to kind of enjoy it with us. So let's say – because I know they're talking about uh, Greeny getting his own show or something in the morning. W- let's say he goes and does a morning show. You step in for him. Who takes Greeny's role? Will that be you kind of as the, the host leading the show? Yeah, that would be interesting. So I've done some hosting, but uh, especially in that chair on that show, 
there's a lot that goes into it. It's basically a, a sort of a, ho a hosting obstacle course of sorts in there. So uh, my guess is they would probably bring in a third party. I don't know who that would be at this point, but uh, would probably bring in someone who's more established in that role and then make sure that, you know, me and dad can just go out there and be ourselves. Because when you get into that other chair, if you're not, if you're not used to what's going on over there and I've seen it firsthand, it can really take you out of sorts right there just because they get so much traffic on that show because you know, thankfully it, it does well for the company. <laughs> Oh yeah, that that chair. I don't think anybody has any idea what's going through. I, I'm sure he has producers in his ear the whole time. He has a million different calls up on his on his thing. He has live reads he's doing all the time. Like Greeny, Greeny is a true professional. Didn't he go to Northwestern? Yep, he was a he's a North. Oh, he'll he'll let you know it too. Oh, and they're yeah. all they're all hopped up right now because Northwestern's men's team looks like they're going to make the tournament for the first time ever. So it, it's crazy around ESPN too. If you're a, if you're a Northwestern or a Syracuse grad, you've got a lot of company. So the the few Notre Dame grads that we have in the building kind of have to band together because there's a lot of purple and orange. Oh no question. What is your like? What is your dad's prep look like for that show? Does he even though he's been doing it so many years, does he still? have to uh, do a lot of prep leading into each show? Yes, yeah, so they get there usually about five. So they get there about an hour before the show. And, and to their, you know, they've got such a, a big staff on that show that does a really good job of helping them out. You get a ton of information going into that show. You know, the few times I've filled in with them, you get a sense for it. You get packets of information you get to pour over there. Him and Greeny are both really used to, you know, understanding what they need to get from a lot of the games that have happened because – you know, they've been getting up at 420 for 17 years now. And so especially getting up there, I mean, Greeny's in his mid to late 40s. Dad's in his you know mid 50s now. You're not going to be able to stay up and watch all those games anymore. So it's getting up in the morning and understanding, all right, what do I need to pull from this? And so they'll get up and they'll watch a lot of the replays. You can get condensed copies of a lot of the games that, uh, through work there that they'll watch and, and just try and glean what they have to and then use what stats and info, info provides from them. And, and you know they're really in such a great rhythm with that that they can pretty much look at whatever's happened and understand and pull, all right, this is probably what the angle is going to be. This is going to be what people want to talk about from this event and go from there. Now, what kind of prep do you have for your show other than trying to stay up late enough and, and watching all of the games? Yeah, ours is a little different. Our staff isn't quite as extensive yet, and they're not going to pump all the, the resources into us quite yet. We're working on that. But, uh, you know, we send out uh, our producers and, and our executive producers will send out kind of an email rundown the night before where – it, we go we go to bed with an idea of what we're going to talk about based on the day, and then you wake up. We all get in there around three three fifteen, and and use that hour or so to make sure nothing happened at night that we need to react to and maybe change course with, and, and just sort of the same deal. It's a shorter show, so you can hug the big topics a little closer, but it's making sure all right, we find an angle that we can work with callers, that we can work with people on Twitter and, and try and make it as interactive as possible. Because that's the one thing that shocked me most about the time slot is is just how many people are up and engaged and listening. Like who who is it? I, I do a lot of uh, radio on Sirius XM now, and it's sometimes 7 to 11 at night, 11 to 3 during the day. It's always – it's never super early, but a lot of our callers are truck drivers and people that are on the road commuting. Like who who are who's really engaged the most? Yeah, I would say uh, truck drivers come up a lot with us. We have uh, a lot of that. We have a lot of people who get up early and work out before they go and get started with their work day. And then on the West Coast, I mean, we're we're called first and last because. Quite, we know that on the West Coast, we could be that last thing that people are listening to coming home from a late shift. I mean, we've we've basically made our bread and butter with the third shifters out there. That's who uh, who we kind of look to serve the people that are, are are working at all different hours of the day. And to their credit, they're all they were really receptive to it because you know before that they had tape programming that was just running and re-airing, and so when they started to get a live product at that, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I think, excitement around that and people really responded well to that. And it's been cool to be a part of. So where all does your radio show go out on video and audio? Uh, so we're not on TV, thankfully, because that allows me to roll into the studio in jeans and a hoodie. In Don't the you morning. stream it? Doesn't it stream online somewhere? 
Uh, no, thankfully we don't oh. stream online. We, we put the podcast out online, which is probably our main source of listening, actually, because when you're done at 6 a.m., we're the first podcast that goes up every day. Mm -hmm. So right at 6, we're able to put that up on there. And, you know, people that are going on that maybe you know, can't listen to Mike and Mike for whatever reason have our podcast pulled up right there. So we're, a, you know, and we're a national show, too. So we're, we're in all the markets. We're on the ESPN app. Uh, you can pull us up pretty much anywhere, which is uh, has been cool. And, and now as you kind of go out, we've been doing it since April. So we're getting close to a, a year of doing the show, going out and kind of meeting the people who have you know become our listener base and people who have been regular listeners is, has been a lot of fun. It, it's cool to know that people are actually receiving the product and enjoying it. What is that studio like? What does ESPN's campus look like when you show up at 3 a.m.? Like, is it dead? It, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. So we get in kind of before everyone else gets into the building. Some of the Mike and Mike show staff is starting to stream in then. But uh, I'd say that's the other audience that we're probably uh, really putting it out to is the rest of ESPN that's slowly filtering into the building during our show, whether it's the morning sports center crew coming in there, Mike and Mike staff coming in. We're kind of the, the soundtrack to their drive to work too, but we get in there. And then by the time we get in, everyone over in the radio building where we're at has gone over to make sure that Mike and Mike's going fine. So we get to sort of slip in and out under cover of darkness. <laughs> so how many staff would you say work on your show? On our show, so our show is interesting. So uh, Robin Lundberg, who's my co-host, uh, has been working at ESPN for a while, actually does his leg. He lives and, and worked at 98.7 ESPN in New York. So Robin does his leg in New York. And then our producer for the show and executive producer are both based out of there. And then on my end, it'd be, it'll usually be me, another uh, AP on the show, and then who's ever working the boards for us. So I'd say all in all, that puts us at, you know, about seven, eight people maybe at the max for our show in a given day. And is it is it always the same crew of people? Uh, yeah, for, you know, for the, the, the producer, the uh, AP, and the executive producer all stay uh, pretty pat. The board ops, just because they're the, they're the overnight shift, and I always tell people those are the real heroes of our show because they're there from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. doing the overnight shift with all the shows that we have going on in that time slot. So anytime people bring up when I have to get up in the morning, I tell them, no, listen, those guys have a way more whacked out sleep schedule than I could ever imagine. So that position, there's a little bit of turnover there just because they use that spot to train a lot of the board ops that come in. But besides that, the rest of the crew stays pretty steady. Now, if your your co host is in New York, uh, and you're uh, in driving into Bristol, have you ever thought about just getting the unit and doing it from home and saving some sleep? Yeah, you know, I've thought about it, but for me, I, I've noticed early on even that uh, I enjoy reacting to the rest of the people in the room, mm -hmm. and I've done shows from uh, you know I've got a unit that I can take on the road if I need to, and it's actually bailed me out a few times. But uh, when push comes to shove, I like having that feel of being in the room with everyone else. And, and Robin and I, kind of like this, we FaceTime during the show. So we've got that line of sight with each other and, and can react off that. But, you know, I, I like knowing if I say something and we can get a laugh in the room, you kind of get that response and can feed off that. And, you know, we throw to them a fair amount and try and get everyone involved. That's, that makes sense. I, I do all the my serious stuff from from my house here. And it's really, really nice to be able to do it. Like I could do late – I put my kids to bed and do the 7 to 11 show at night, whatever. But you're right. It is, sometimes it, it does feel good to go into a studio and like be around. Like the atmosphere, you, you need to feel other people or else sometimes you feel like, well, I don't know. Is anybody listening? Am I talking to anybody other than my co-host? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it is kind of a, a weird thing to, to deal with there. You're right. The convenience is, is off the charts and – and have definitely benefited from that some. But, yeah, there is something to be said for just that camaraderie. I mean, because I, I think to an extent we're all kind of chasing that old locker room feel too mm -hmm. uh, of just being around people and being able to have a bit of that back. And, you know, that provides some of it. It will never be like it was. But at the very least, you get that group of people that you get comfortable enough around it to start having those relationships with. Now, what about – so you're, so Mike and Mike is simulcast on TV – and I think a lot of people watch it on TV. I mean, usually you think, oh, a radio show on that's televised, you're going to, most, the majority of people listen, which I'm, they have a huge audio listening, uh, people that just listen to audio, but it's, it's on everywhere you go, obviously. ESPN, all the multiple ESPN, ESPN2, wherever you go, the, the channels are on. So people are watching them do a radio show. 
how different is that for you and how aware of you of the cameras are you when you're doing radio but you know like oh wait i'm live on tv this whole time yeah so that that's what makes their show an interesting animal and it's evolved a lot over the years to where now i'd say it's more of a tv show Mm -hmm. uh, than a radio show really at this point and espn put a lot of, uh, of time and money into making that TV product just as good, if not maybe better uh, than what they've got on radio. And so you do kind of have to always be aware of where the camera is going to go and, you know, it's it, simple as how you dress. I mean, it, their show's pretty relaxed. And so, you know, dad at this point will show up and, you know, a quarter zip or a hoodie or something like that. And he can get away with that. The first few times I went on, you know, I thought, all right, that's the, the MO of the show. And, it was passed down to me that maybe early on you probably should dress a little better for TV, understanding how many eyes are going to be on that. So it's a, it's just little things like that to where you, you understand that that's going to be a component of it. You've got to, to, to bring some of that visual and their graphics people and, and everything they do with that all adds that element to it too. It does. So you say that that was passed down to you to maybe dress up a bit like who, who passes that down? Is that your dad or someone, a producer or who? No, that's, you know, my, uh, one of my bosses in radio, you know, I, I answer to a bunch of different people at this point because basically everyone's above me right now. So I just kind of, whoever's shouting down closest to me, I listen to, but between them and my agent, it was kind of made clear to me that, you know what, you're, you're still very early on into this. So maybe put your, put your best foot forward before you just start, you know, mailing the outfits in the way dad can 17 years in now. (laughs) Do do people ever give you a hard time for the whole nepotism deal and say, you only got this gig because of your dad? Oh yeah. I mean, early on, that was what I heard thrown at me left and right. And, you know, thankfully as, as you go on and, you know, I'm sure there's even people I've worked with that have felt like that. and, And some of them have admitted it to me, but Usually the refrain is then once the uh, people have a chance to work with me, they see that I, I just, you know, like everyone else, want to come in and work hard at this. And I, I like to think that at this point I've shown I'm pretty good at it right now. Obviously I have a ton of room left to grow there, but uh, you just learn pretty quickly to drown that out. I mean, even football wise, I dealt with that for a long time going to the same school my dad did and following his footsteps in that way. So you just kind of learn to not let it bother you. Yeah, because uh, Collinsworth's son, Jack, does radio as well, correct? Yeah, yeah, Jack's, Jack's been doing a great job, too. He did, a, I know, a ton of work at Notre Dame, too, but has, has been doing a serious XM show as well and, uh, you know, has that great Collinsworth voice like his dad. It's it's sort of eerie hearing the two of them uh, talk separately, which is, you know, sort of the pot calling the kettle black there, I guess, with me and dad. But, uh, uh, yeah, no, Jack's been, Jack's been killing it, so that's been fun to watch, too. But, you know, I've talked to him. He deals with all the same stuff. Yeah, I'm sure when when both of your dads are such public figures and everybody knows their name and know, knows their voice, yeah, for sure. I'm sure people instantly that you work with before they get to know you, it, it crosses their mind. At least like, oh, now you now you guys are both kind of established, so I'm sure it doesn't happen nearly as often. But you, when you said uh, that, made me think of: Did you play with uh, Bon Jovi's kid at Notre Dame? Uh, so I miss Jesse a little bit. Yeah, he was. Uh, he he walked on there. Uh, I think a year after I left, and you know, I, I've gotten a chance. I go back every now and then to do stuff with the team, and so I, I've gotten to know Jesse a little bit. But yeah, his. Uh, I mean, that's a, a, an even more interesting situation when your dad's an international superstar. Yeah, and so he's. But his his the real name was bon, bon Jovi. Is that right? Yeah, Bon Jovi. Yep. But it's like it's spelled a little differently. Not not how Bon Jovi spells for their band. So yeah. They're- I think there's just no space in it. I think it's all it? it's all together instead of with the space, which I don't really understand the method behind it. But I'm also not a rock star, so I don't understand what plays with that crowd. <laughs> yeah, I thought there was a G or so. I don't. It doesn't matter. He, his son is like uh, he's doing pretty well, isn't he? Uh, doesn't he get some good playing time now? Yeah, so he does. Uh, he does some stuff with that, and he's also like their main signal guy, which in Coach Kelly's offense, everything and like a lot of college offense, everything comes from the sideline, and usually that lead signal or ends up. You know, getting a lot of camera time because you're right next to Coach Kelly all the time. So uh, yeah, Jesse's uh, Jesse's found his way in front of the camera and has uh, has maximized that. He's become uh, another in a long line of great signalers at Notre Dame that uh, a couple of my friends started with, and now he's carried on the tradition. And what about Lorenzo Fertitta? His son is there as well. Yeah, yeah, he is. So uh, yeah, you, you get a lot of those. I mean, we had um, we had Tory Hunter, uh, his son Tory Hunter Jr. was a wide receiver for the team a little bit. So Notre Dame, I, I mean, it's a, it's a school built on legacy, certainly, but you get a fair amount of those guys coming through who 
whether it was, you know, Nate Montana, Joe's son was a classmate of mine, a preferred walk on for us uh, that came in the same year as I did. And so you kind of see a lot of that and you see guys you know, have to deal with varying degrees of, of, you know, the nepotism conversation or just that constant comparison and kind of see how everyone deals with it in their own way. Yeah, Lorenzo Fertitta, for people who don't know, he he bought the UFC however many years ago for $3 million and they just sold it for $4.25 billion. So he just got out of that, and I know he's, uh, he, at least following him, and I follow the UFC a lot, he he talks about going to his son's games, and his son, was uh, I think, plays safety. Yeah. I'm going to have to watch more Notre Dame this year, man, and really uh, – really brush up I, when i saw bon jovi's kid there and because you see like bon jovi in the sidelines sometimes I'm like man i'd like to be there just to bug his son with questions about his dad I'm oh it's hilarious and I, I actually remember going back for a game one time and they do the player walk right by the goog and usually a lot of the parents are over there and they've got their their kind of spot where they always stand so you know where to find them and it was funny because i look out there and all of a sudden you know someone tapped me from behind to say hi and it was John Bon Jovi, but he was all done up. You know, it was a little cold out, but he had like kind of the scarf situated around his head so he could move and not really be noticed as much. But, uh, you know, he, he let you know when he was uh, there just to say hi and then went right back to kind of being undercover. He would have to. I, it would it would be annoying for him and his son probably, too, has to deal with that all the time. Like, would, luckily, I guess, for for his son – Bon Jovi's still gigantic, but I'm sure like 18 and 19 year olds don't feel the same about that band that say 35 to 50 year olds do. So, I yeah, mean. exactly. Maybe maybe not the target demo for them, but you're right. I mean, because there's you know every part of them that just want to be father and son and experience his kid being on the team right now and and just get to do it like everyone else. Unfortunately, that gets to be a little hard in the the position he's in. But you know they they find a way to make it as normal as possible. What about Jim Caviezel? You ever cross him, uh, cross his paths with him at Notre Dame? I have not yet. No, JC, uh, JC himself, I have not uh, managed to run into. So still waiting on that one right there. That would be a, especially knowing, you know, obviously all the, the great religious ties for Notre Dame. That would be an interesting meeting. He was so Brady Quinn was, um, I don't know if he hung out with him on campus one day or something. Uh, Maybe he was, maybe Caviezel was in character for Passion of the Christ or something. So just wandering around Notre Dame's campus in robes and stuff, getting ready for that role. But Brady said he was on campus one time and said he was a very interesting dude. I can believe that, especially if you have to method act and be <laughs> Jesus Christ. That can probably put you in a pretty interesting mental space right there. Ed. But uh, on Notre Dame's campus, I mean, that's as, that's as close to home base as you're going to get if you're him. <laughs> yeah, why not, man? That's the heartland. That's the heartland for you guys. Yeah, man, that's that's cool. What about uh, – I'm going to wrap it up here. But what about your dad? Does your dad ever give you advice, give you feedback on what you do, or do you even ask him for it? Uh, yeah, no, I, I always use him kind of the same way I did at football. I mean, I started watching tape with my dad when I was in high school and going over that stuff just because I, I always figured I'd be a fool not to use that resource. And everyone has someone, whether it's a coach or, or uh, another adult or, or a, a veteran player that they trust as that extra set of eyes. I had that guy in house and that worked for me through football all the way through college, you know, trying in the NFL. And now when I get to here, I mean, I've got a guy that's been doing exactly what I want to do for like I said, you know, 17 years plus now. So, you know, he, he picks up little things and he understands where to interject. He's never really overbearing with it. But when I ask him, you know, can you listen to something, especially doing things new, you know, when I tried calling games, when I got into studio stuff for the first time for, for him to just watch and kind of notice all those little things that especially being my dad and being around me all the time, He'll tell, you know, when I'm a little bit too uptight with something or when I'm reaching for something that maybe is uncharacteristic of me and just you know, little reminders to just be yourself because that's the easiest advice I think I've gotten going into this, but the one that's hardest to practice at certain times. Do you uh, plan on calling uh, more games? I saw you called uh, what the pit bowl game with your with your dad in the booth. Yeah, yeah, we got to do the uh, the three man booth for the pinstripe bowl. There, it was Pitt and Northwestern uh, there, and I know we've told them that you know we got good feedback on that one, and we both really had a ton of fun with it. So hopefully, we'll we'll get to do that again together. But yeah, I definitely like to call more games. I mean, that's the closest to, I I think preparing for a football game the way you would when you were a player. It's 
you know, it's watching tape. It's going, you know, scouting the opponents on both teams. You get to to talk to the coaches and everything again. So it gets you as close to the action as you can. Yeah, you guys did a good job. I turn, I just happened to turn it on, and I was like, "Have they been doing this all year?" And I just didn't notice. Like, was that your first game you did together? Yeah, that was our first one I, I did together. I'd gotten, you know, we had done a, a game on radio together the year before, and I had called a couple uh, on radio leading up to that. But that was our first time ever. Uh, in the booth together. And I mean, God, when, uh, before I got to high school, that was a lot of what he did. I mean, he called games all the time. I remember going to, you know, to see Mike Vick and Virginia tech playing like the insight bowl in Arizona, Larry Fitzgerald, when he was at Pitt, when he was calling games all growing up. So that was another area where he had done it for so long that me going through it for the first time, I'm asking him everything possible in the preparation leading up to it to make sure I don't screw this up. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I, it'll be fun to, to see if you guys get in the booth again. I think ESPN should try that. Just two two big monsters and then a poor play-by-play by getting pushed out by both of you guys. Those booths are not that big. No, they're not, man. They had the makeshift booth there in Yankee Stadium, too. And I felt so bad. Ryan Rucco, who's, uh, who calls a bunch of uh, uh, games across various sports, based out of New York there. Great guy, did an awesome job that day, but he's not the biggest guy. And then you combine that with the fact that he's standing next to the two of us. Twitter had a good bit of fun with the size <laughs> difference there. And I uh, I had to tell everyone, I was like, Brian's not that small. It's just, you know, he's, he's standing next to us. Yeah, hey, that's understandable, man. All right, uh, where, uh, where would you want people to find you, man, on social media, Twitter, wherever? Yeah, uh, Twitter, I'm uh, at junior 57 That'd be the, the same for Instagram. Those are really my two mainstays there. And uh, other than that, they can check out First and Last. It's, you know, like I said, 4 to 6 a.m. Eastern. And uh, if not, we got the podcast. It's on uh, the ESPN app. It's on iTunes. And uh, also the, the show I do on Sundays with uh, Stu Gotts from the Dan Levitard Show, Weekend Observations, where you were uh, kind enough to join us. Uh, before the Super Bowl leading up to that one. So uh, A.J. Hawk, a friend of the show, and uh, you can check that one out too. Yeah, man, it was fun. I had a good time with you guys. I wanna, uh, I'd want to. i love to call back in sometime. But thanks, man. Really, really appreciate your time. Have fun waking up at 2.45, and, and people will be checking you out 4 to 6 a.m. And, and on all, we'll, we'll link everything up when we post this. But thanks a lot, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at officialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawkcast.